Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I'm excited to have Charity Norman back again. I always love talking to you, Charity. So glad to have oh. you back again. I love talking to you. <laughs> and want to also remind people that Charity is one of um, Global Girl Online Book Club's associated authors. So you probably see her popping in from time to time with posts about what she might have been reading or what she's been up to. So thanks so much for joining us again, Charity. Um, for those Thank who you. don't know a little bit about Charity. So Charity was born in Uganda and brought up in, a, in successive drafty vicarages in Yorkshire and Birmingham. After several years travel, she became a barrister, specialising in crime and family law in the northeast of England. Also a mediator and telephone crisis line listener, she's passionate about the power of communication to slice through the knots. In 2002, realising that her three children had barely met her, she took a break from law and moved with her family to Aotea, New Zealand. Her first novel, Free and Grace, was published in 2010. Second Chance was a Richard and Judy book club choice and World Book Night title. See You in September in 2017 was shortlisted for the Best Crime Novel in the 2018 Nio Marsh Awards for Best Crime Novel. And, sorry, I lost where I was for a minute. For be, yep. And The Secrets of Strangers is her sixth book and has been shortlisted for Best International Crime Fiction at the 2021 Ned Kelly Awards and shortlisted for Best Novel in the 2021 Nio Awards. Remember Me is her seventh book. Boom, I'm trying to show my copy as well. Um, oh, I'm back front. <laughs> and um, we got Charity to join us today to talk a little bit about Remember Me. Um, a great list of awards and accolades. And we just recently spoke to her about The Secrets of Strangers, which was our book club read, I think, think for February, if I'm right. In January or February, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, as I said, great to have you back again. Just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about Remember Me. Why not? Yes, I will. Thank you very much for having me here, Jackie. If I if I suddenly yelp, it's because my cat is coming okay. and she's a psychopath <laughs> okay. and, and, uh, and she wants attention. But um, you see, remember, which I see is I thought I'd put I thought I'd put my screen not mirrored, but um, oh, is that it's mirrored? fine. No, it's fine for me. Oh, good. That's so, good. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yes, you remember me. Um. It's my seventh novel. It's um. It starts 25 years ago when a young woman called Lea Parata, who is a conservationist, uh, heads out into the Ruahine Ranges, which are in the um, Hawke's Bay region of the east coast of New Zealand. Uh, and she heads out there to go hiking and to look for a particular kind of snail, and she's never seen again. And the last person she speaks to is um, a, a teenager at that stage called Emily Kirkland. So 25 years later, Emily Kirkland is now an illustrator. She's living in London. Um, she's a single mother. She gets a call from her family friend um, to tell her that her father is unwell, that he's got Alzheimer's and that he needs somebody to come home and look after him. So she comes back to New Zealand to look after her dad. And as, uh, as she does so, she realizes just how badly affected by Alzheimer's disease he is. And as his mind begins to change and melt, um, she also begins to realise that he's not the man she thought he was at all. And uh, to suspect that he's connected in some way with the disappearance of Lea Parata. So there are two threads there, really, which is um, the sort of cold case mystery of Lea Parata. And connected with that is the, um, the changing relationship between Emily Kirkland and her dad, Dr. Felix Kirkland, who is the local GP. And I just wanted to mention as well, we've got quite a few people watching, which is great. Hi, um, everyone. People watching, if you have any questions for Charity, please type them in comments and I can read them out. And everyone who does ask a question during the Facebook Live will have a chance to win a copy of Remember Me, thanks to Alan and Unman. So 
please um, type your questions. I just wanted to say that um, I recently finished Remember Me and really loved it. Um, it's the second of your books that I've read now. I really find um, in your books, your characters really seem to, like the way you develop your characters in that. I love that. And probably this one more than Secrets of Strangers, but the, the setting as well, because Secrets of Strangers was more just in the cafe. But um, Remember Me, like with the different scenery and all that, I really enjoyed that with Remember Me as well. Oh, good. Good. Oh, thank you. Yes, it was, I wrote it, when I wrote it, I was actually living in, mostly in Wellington, um, where I'd mm -hmm. gone to look after a relative who wasn't well. So, um, although I know the Ruahine Ranges really well, and I've lived, I'm back here now living quite close to them. And um, when the children were small, um, we were living here and I'd take them to the school bus in the mornings and I'd see the mountains sort of covered in snow. And, um, we just moved here and I, I I couldn't believe that everyone was so blasé about these astoundingly beautiful mountains. And so mm. to li then be living in Wellington and, and be able to come back in my mind and write about them was actually really lovely. You know, it was mm. really nice. It's, when you're a tiny bit homesick, you write better about that place. So um, I was sitting looking out of my window at the beehive, you know, at Parliament, mm. um, which I'm sure you know, right. Jack, is yeah. New Zealand Parliament. And... Um, and writing about um, the ranges in Central Hawke's Bay, which is this very um, far-flung sort of rural community. So I'm glad you I'm glad you like that aspect. New Zealand's yeah. countryside is very easy to write about because it's mm. just so lovely and mm. so magical. And I have to say as well, I think from um, living away now from New Zealand, like when mm. you're living in New Zealand, you sort of take for granted yeah. The, uh, and it's not until like I've been away and then come back again that you do realise how beautiful things are. So true, mm. isn't it? It is. We, it's our mm. own backyard, isn't it? We do take it for granted. I think mm. I'm less for me in that I'm a I'm an incomer. You know, I mm. came from um, came from England, although I came from a really beautiful part up in Yorkshire. Um, so I'm still I will still sometimes drive round a corner and just go. I don't believe I don't believe this view is here and mm. everyone's just driving past and not looking at it yeah but it's the whole country's like a sort of giant picnic spot mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and could you tell us a bit about what um the first idea you had was for remember me I think looking back um it was well there were two bits to it one one was I did want to write something set here in the ranges I hadn't written anything I'd written a couple of other books set in New Zealand. See mm. You in September is set at Lake Tarawera. Um, and um, Second Chances is set in Northern Hawke's Bay. But I wanted to set something in the ranges. Um, and then in uh, 2016, um, my mother died of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And I, I, well, I knew that she, was, that, she was, that she was dying, that she was going. Um, she had, you know, how she kept getting chest infections. And so I, I got on a plane and um, didn't get there quite in time. But um, I was helping to arrange her funeral and her life and so on. And um, I found myself tidying up her bedroom. And I, I was looking in the drawers in her desk, trying to organize everything. And um, it was quite an extraordinary experience. As you, I'm sure you've experienced people who have had Alzheimer's and most people have. Mm. And and so you, you know, you'll know that it, it isn't a, an illness that just gets you all at once. It, it, it nibbles away slowly and people just become sort of more and more erased as the years mm. go on. And when I was in my mother's room, it was like being in a museum from several years earlier, you know, that I realized that she hadn't changed things or moved things or her, 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 um, all her mail was from sort of five years earlier and the last letters she'd written and the last sort of work she'd done. And none of us had quite understood that at the time. And then I found in a drawer, I found um, a stack of diaries and they, they were just appointment diaries. You know, I wasn't reading her personal mm. diaries, but um, she, when I looked in the diaries, I realized you could see the progression of her changing as the years went on. There were several years and you could see her handwriting changing and the things she wrote and things she cared about were changing 
And then I found she'd written a whole list of things she wanted to remember. Mm. And she'd written the names of all of us children, the seven of us, mm. and her sister and a girl called Yanni, who was in the kinder transport, who they looked after in the war, her family. And she'd written things like, I play the violin and I am a teacher to remind mm. herself of who she was. Mm. And that, you know, I realised then just how she'd been clinging on to mm. her memories into her identity into her intellect into who she was it was a, quite an amazing and tragic sort of realization mm. that although to us she'd seemed in pre quite calm but increasingly confused and then less and less calm and more and more angry what was actually going on was she was terrified you know so that i sort of got me thinking and i and it a bit later, I began to think about what would happen if I'd found something in these diaries that I shouldn't have seen. Mm. I mean, there was nothing, there was no secrets. Mm. But what if I found, what if mm. I discovered something I shouldn't have seen? And um, and I began to think about that. And and also, you know, she began to tell us more and more things about herself. She became, she became more honest, the barriers came down. And um, sometimes she'd say something that was even a bit inappropriate, but you've got to know her in a different way. And so I began to think, well, you know, what if somebody actually had a, a really, a really a secret so terrible that it would rip their entire community apart? Mm. And what could that be? And what if it was really something almost unforgivable or appeared to be? And so then I, I got that idea together with my thoughts about setting something in the Uruhanes. And um, it took a while, you know, I spent about two weeks walking about I'm kind of trying to think of a plot and then I, I sort of it came together all at once mm -hmm. and like you so, said about I can see I now frozen. yeah I think it froze for a minute but it's okay now um I could see how like how you said with the notes and that with your mother how you've related that, that in like the book with the notes and remembering the people and the yeah Yes, that's right. I did. Mm. I did put it into the. Sometimes when you're writing a book, you're not even. Re you don't quite realise that you're actually stealing things from your own life or mm. from other people's lives. Mm. But yes, there is a scene in the book where Emily um, Emily finds her father's diaries and um, discovers first that he was much more compromised than she had realised for longer than she had. Mm. People get very good at covering up don't they you know they mm. get so good at pretending that normally write yeah. lists for themselves mm. and yeah that's it's tragic really mind you mm. i keep forgetting things mm. <laughs> writing yeah. lists yeah. <laughs> there's too it's many terrifying. too many things to remember <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> um belinda wonders if you've had a favorite character to write oh belinda that's that is a good question um the Mm. I mean, the, for a long time, my answer would have been, and perhaps still is, for my very first book, Free and Grace, there's a character called Jake, um, who is a New Zealander, in fact, and he, um, I mean, I was younger when I wrote it, and so Jake then was about 40, and I was, you know, I would have been slightly younger than Jake. Well, I had a bit of a crush on Jake, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it's pretty gorgeous. And um, so, uh, and I really liked, I liked him. I really, he's a laid back New Zealander with commitment anxiety, but really kind. And um, so, you know, probably, probably still Jake from Free and Grace. Yeah. I got very fond of Lucia from The Secret Life of Luke Livingston, who is a trans woman. Um, and I, I sort of really, as I wrote that, I became so immersed in it that um, I did get very fond of Lucia. But honestly, I mean, most of my characters I can get pretty close to. Um, Sam in The Secrets of yeah. Strangers and Mutesi mm. in The Secrets of Strangers. Um, mm. She was, she was um, a, well, I thought she was a lovely character. I really loved her and I'd love to have had her in my life. Mm. Mm. And Kelly said she loved Jake. He's also her favourite. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, good. It's not just me then. At the time, I thought Johnny Depp maybe could play Jake. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thought there could be maybe a casting couch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Jill and, K and Kelly, they both wonder like what you like to read and whether there's anything you might like to recommend to us. 
Well, um, at the moment, I'm reading a New Zealand book, Nikki Crutchley's book, To the Sea. Oh, yes. And I, I think Nikki to Crutchley, yeah. you spoke to her, didn't you, yeah. a, short, yeah. um, a short while ago. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm right, right, right in the middle of that, and it's absolutely compelling. It's keeping me up. Um, and just so beautifully atmospheric and, mm. you know, so much going on there. Um, and uh, Paul Cleave, I'm fond of the books of Paul Cleave. It's another new, uh, another New Zealand writer who writes, um, who writes crime books. Um, Rose Carlyle, I don't know if you read, have you read The Girl, uh, the, um, the Girl in the Mirror? It's a, it's a crime novel, uh, with a difference really about twins. Um, and I hope that she will have another book coming out soon. Um, and I've just finished, well, a while ago now, but it's, you know, how some books stay with you. Um, another New Zealander, um, Dame Fiona Kidman, mm -hmm. and she's, uh, she's getting, getting rather older than I am now. Um, she's an amazing, extraordinary, you know, uh, treasure, absolute literary treasure, but, um, she wrote a book which won the Nio Marsh Awards, and it's um, This Mortal Boy. And that's about the very last hanging, or the, one of the last hangings in New Zealand. Oh, it's an Irish, he was an Irish kid, mm -hmm. came here, he got into a fight, somebody died. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a true story. Mm -hmm. As a travesty, um, it was a travesty of justice. He shouldn't have been convicted, I don't think. And uh, he was hanged. And it's, it's, a, it's a brilliantly researched and heartbreakingly written book, which has sort of stuck with me, you know, how mm. it'll be one of the books for this year, I think, for yeah. me, mm. probably. No, that sounds interesting, yeah. Um, mm. It is, and actually, while I was, while I was, um, while I was tidying up, um, I spotted my brother's book. I have a, my brother, Stephen Norman, who's okay. written a book called Trading Down, mm. which um, is still around and available. So I guess he's my brother, I bet I should, uh, it's very good, it's very good. <laughs> what sort of genre does he write? Uh, he's written just one so far, um, and it's crime. He was in, he's had very, many and varied career. He's 10 years older than me, but um, this particular one is a, it's a thriller set in the world of banking. Okay. And um, which doesn't sound that exciting, but it, it is, mm, yeah. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I, I was absolutely gripped by it, and I would have mm -hmm. said that even if he wasn't my brother. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for those recommendations. We love getting more books to add to our lists. There's always more. <laughs> yeah, There's exactly. so many more. Exactly. Um, Sharon wonders how long um, Remember Me took you to write. Um, it, two years in total, Sharon. I started, I got the synopsis together, and then... Um, I, but while I was starting to research it, because there was a lot of research in it, I was finishing off the editing and rewriting and editing of um, The Secrets of Strangers. So there is an overlap. Mm. So it's, it's a bit blurred, you know, and you say, how long has it taken? There is quite a long period of time, often getting on for a year where I'm finishing one and, and rewriting it, editing it, and starting the next. The next but yeah. I would say from really the first idea to you know <laughs> seeing it mm. seeing it sort of published would be two years. Yeah, yeah. And you said you did a lot of research. Can you tell us what sort of research you did? Yes, um, I I always do a lot, and I with all my with all my books, I've tended to have a new topic or a new area that I've had to, had to research. And, um, you know, so you, you become temporarily an expert in cults or, mm. or um, you know, um, or gender dysphoria or something like that, <laughs> or pure mess I was for a while. Mm. And it, it's amazing because I'll start looking at my family and I'll start going, you know, are you on something? Are you, <laughs> <laughs> what have you been taking? They go, mom, just because you're writing a book about, you know, mess. <laughs> Um, so with Remember Me, it was a um, number of things I had to research, Alzheimer's, or I knew I'd experienced that, mm. but still a lot, you know, you've got to get it right, mm. and um, Huntington's, Huntington's disease, which is um, a neurological degenerative um, disease, I'm sure, you know, some readers have come across it, um, it's genetic, so um, if a parent has it, their offspring has a 50% chance 
um, of having it all under 50% chance of not. Nowadays, there is a test for it. Um, but, you know, of course, there's problems. If you do the test, you find out that you're yeah, positive yeah. and, you, you know, you will eventually yeah. get it. Mm. So I spent a lot of time researching that um, and trying to understand exactly what it meant in practice to to somebody and to a family as well as to um, the individual. Mm. And, and I had come across families. I did know a family who'd been touched by it, but a lot of research in that as well. Mm. And then there's, there's all those peripheral things like... Um, you know, hiking in the Rohanis. You know, I'm going to be honest, I am not really a an outdoor mountain woman, you know. I have walked across the ranges um, once for a friend's 50th birthday, and we walked across and stopped in huts on the way, and I've been up quite a few times to our local hut, but I'm not one of these people that gets their big boots on and goes up every every weekend, you know. Yeah. But I talked to people who were, mm. <laughs> and, um, you know, read a lot of books about that, and I, I started reading things like the Wilderness Magazine and the, um, you know, the local tramping club um, newsletters and trying to work out, you know, what what exactly would the weather be like and what exactly would it feel like to be there in winter and um and also what happens when somebody goes missing you know what who do you call and then how are they organized and how do the search and rescues yeah. work and, and that's quite interesting yeah, and i had to try and work to... out what that was like in 29 yeah. in um you know 25 years ago as yeah. well which is different I could have put you on to my brother-in-law. He does search and rescue in New oh. Zealand in the mountains for the place. Oh, does he? Yeah. Oh, well, if I'd known that, I would have, <laughs> I would have definitely bothered mm. you. I, uh, yeah, mm. that would have been very useful. It would have saved me many hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kelly says she loves all your books, especially the titles, <laughs> and she wonders what input you have in choosing the titles. Oh, thank you, Kelly. Um, no, generally, uh, I get a lot of input in the titles. Um, I've normally got a working title, and I, I towards the end of the process where where we're really starting to edit the book, and it's going to be um, we we need to start thinking about marketing it and the cover and so on. Um, we'll we'll sort of firm up on that um, on the title. Um, I mean, the more books you write, I'd say, the more say you've got, <laughs> get mm, just a little bit more, yeah. I suppose you get more experience and also a bit more, maybe a little bit more elbow. Mm. Um, so the, the only one where I really, there were, there were, there were two really, where I, I wasn't entirely sure that I'd chosen the title. Um, my second book is um, called After the Fall in the United, in England, and it's got different names in other countries, like other tra yeah. in translation that's they'll give them completely different oh, no, names that's a bit confusing sometimes it's, isn't it's, it? it can be a bit confusing yeah. i think it's called something about the truth of that night or something in mm. german but um the the uh, uh, my australian publishers didn't want to call it after the fall and they came up with second chances they gave me a list and i said well i can live with these three mm. and they picked second chances probably isn't my favorite of the names um and the other one that had two titles for england and and um, the antipodes was luke livingston which is called the new woman in england and that's the one about a um a, a woman transitioning oh, yeah. um and again i did i did come up with suggestion of the secret life of luke livingston so it, it was my choice um but those are the the two that i'm if i had my time again I would maybe really stick up for myself. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Say I'm not happy. Yeah. Um, but with Remember Me, for example, I, I came up with a list, and that's what often happens. I'll say, look, I'm, I'm happy with all of these in this mm. order. And, you know, you have to remember publishers, they're good at what they do. Mm. Alan and Wynnum, they're a lovely publisher. They, mm -hmm. They're good at marketing, but they're good at knowing what is going to work on the shelf and what's going to appeal to readers. So, you know, when they said, oh, we like Remember Me, I was, okay, yeah. we'll go with that. Yeah. And I think they were right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good title and it's got, yeah, lots of significance. That's right, it mm. has. Yes, mm. it has. It was, they were, they were bang on, actually. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And Julie, one, sorry, Jill wonders if you have another book in the pipeline. 
I do, Jill. Yes, it's sort of under wraps at the moment. Um, when I'm doing the, I'm at the research stage where I keep seeing the subject in everybody. Mm. Um, but yeah, I do. I've done the synopsis um, ages ago. I need to get on with it actually. Um, and I sent the synopsis off off to um, to my agent and to my publisher. And so I hope that book will be the next one on the shelves. Mm. I just need to write it, <laughs> which isn't as easy as it sounds. Yeah. Mm. And <laughs> it's a bit like, you know, seeing a massive mountain and knowing you've got to climb it again. <laughs> yeah. And do you think you'll ever mention COVID in any of your books? Uh, well, yes. Um, I, it does get a little tiny mention at the very end of Remember Me. Mm. You, you, you blink and you'd miss it, mm. but there's a there's just a mention in passing at the very end. She talks about how um, there's there's a rumour of a new virus coming yeah, out of China. Right um, yeah. Yes, the book I'm writing now, I I may I think I'm going to mention it, uh, but that again at the end. Yeah. So okay. it's really tricky. I mean, mm. I'm. I talk to other authors about this and um it's difficult isn't it because we don't want to i'm not sure everybody wants to read about covid yeah you know, i was saying i recently read i don't know if you've read jody colt's um have you read that i haven't read it no. i'm seeing Ray, that's another one on my list great yeah. reviews like i liked it but there was it was all a lot about covid and i just sort of felt it was a little bit too much at the current just lived it at the current point of time but yeah, yeah but yeah i really loved how it was written and everything but yeah yes it, i hear it's yeah people love it so i must i must yeah. read it yeah that's the problem is we've all we've all lived it and, and um although the job of an author isn't necessarily to provide an escape mm. um we do kind of like a bit of an escape and also there's a practical problem which is that we've had different experiences of covid in different countries mm. And unless I set it in New Zealand, where really we had 18 months of, well, we were COVID free. And so, yeah. but that was so different from everybody else's experience. And I actually find that very difficult. I don't think they want to read about us being mm. smug and out partying mm. in the streets. And, mm. um, and I'm not, I'd need to do a huge amount of research to set a book in the middle of, um, let's say, july 2020 in london for example i mean i was talking to my family a lot but um there's a lot going on there so I'm, I'm not quite sure but the next book i think will be set in the in the months leading into it and then the the sort of crisis at the end will be in the first few days of the of the pandemic mm -hmm. in march february and march 2020 mm -hmm. oh well, we'll be looking forward to reading that one when it's out and talking to you again oh thank you it's not it's not too long away do you think it might be out next year later next um, year or I, maybe two yeah more likely more likely to um partly depends on publisher schedules although mm. you know i can get it written um since i'm ready now i've researched it got my synopsis and i've begun it um, I can get it written, you know, within a certain length of time, but then there's the editing and then there is the, the schedule. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be holding your breath for, um, for it to be out in the next, you know, year anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, Sharon wonders out of all your, the books you've written, is there one that you enjoyed writing the most? Huh. Wow. They were all different, Sharon. Um, Free and Grace, I wrote in a really different way. I'd just arrived in New Zealand and I was sort of given up my day job mm. and I was looking after the children and I just used to walk along the river bank and wrote it organically. So I'd write a bit and another bit and then I'd unwrite the first bit and I didn't have a plan. And I did enjoy that. I, I enjoyed the writing process doing it like that. I didn't enjoy the uncertainty and never knowing if it would get published or not and how, you know, it took a very long time. But I did really, that was still, there was a real joy in writing. I was really just writing for the, the fun of writing. So I probably did really like writing that, I suppose, the, the best. But writing, um, 
remember me was I really did get a lot out of that you know being in Wellington and then through the COVID mm. the pandemic the strangeness of all of that and it was a bit strange in my own life at that time as well so writing the book was a a, a real sort of escape I suppose it was just mm. a, lovely to sit on my beanbag and get my laptop every day and have to do it and or in the morning I'd, I'd head across the road to the picnic cafe in the rose gardens in the botanical gardens and work away and it was I was really grateful to be writing it was it was one I'm grateful to this book mm. so I'd say probably the first and last books yeah but all of them are yeah. I know I quite like my job <laughs> <laughs> and Joe wonders um if you knew the ending of remember me when you first started writing it I did. Mm. I did with Remember Me. I didn't mm. with um, The Secrets of Strangers. That ending did change. But um, with Remember Me, I did know where it was going. I had, um, I stuck to the synopsis quite faithfully. Mm. And um, I knew that was, the ending was where I was coming to. I was dreading writing it. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's quite... Um, you know, one of those things you you write this morning i'm gonna have to write this scene um and you just get on and do it mm. um, but i did know yeah mm. Mm. and um jill wonders if you have a regular writing routine mm. no jill i should and um and i promise myself with every book that i will have this time and it never happens i'm not good on routine and um my sort of family life is you know, there's there's lots of people involved and people want things at different times and mm -hmm. so um i have at sometimes in my career writing career i've had fixed routines with a couple of the books in the middle we were living in napier and i used to walk down to napier library when it opened i would go in with my cup of takeaway you know coffee and i would work all day and then i'd often work at night as well and I got two books, two but did two books in two years, I think, doing that. Oh, okay. So that worked um, really well for yeah. me. Um, but where we are at the moment, we're in the middle of nowhere. We're living in this mm -hmm. tiny hut. Um, I've got a little tiny, even tinier writing hut. Um, and there's a lot of interruptions. Coming. So I'm often working. I work when I can, and then I'll often work at night. Mm -hmm. Often two, three, four in the morning, I'm oh, still. Oh, really? writing mm. because it's quiet and yeah. nobody phones you or asks mm. of where their <laughs> socks are you know <laughs> and what do you like doing when you're not writing or reading um i well i'm a mad cat lady um mm. i go for how I many go for long how walks. many cats do you have well there were three cats huh. There were three cats approximately in the family, but we, because we've sort of lived a two centre life, I've left a, a rag doll down in Wellington oh. with my daughter. Mm. Um, and then I've got two that are astray, sort of what, work dumped, I think, which mm. I've got here. But one of them has actually disappeared uh, about three nights ago. Oh. So fingers crossed. I'll put, mm. I'll put on my Facebook page when he turns up. Mm. I'm a bit, bit worried about him. Yeah. Um, and I go for long walks and, and by the river and, and I'm singing, well, until until recently singing two choirs um the one that i'm still mostly singing in is the napier cathedral choir um you don't have to have a faith to sing in the choir and the music is absolutely magnificent mm. and it's a great choir with a great director and i love music and um the challenge of sight reading this really interesting music is wonderful it's good and it's it's community and it's good for your breathing it's mm. just really euphoric so mm. that's probably be quite high on my list of hobbies mm. nice yeah and it must be nice in the cathedral as well it mm. is it's, it's um it's peaceful and it and i do yoga that's that's also mm. um unfortunately yoga is the same night as um cathedral choir rehearsal so oh. somebody's going to be upset <laughs> <but>. <laughs> And Cal wonders if any of your books have anything set in Australia. Not yet, no. Okay. No. She's wondering um, if you I, might consider that in the future. I really would. You know, I, mm. I, I would like to. I would love to spend more time in Australia. I really would. I find it just fascinating. I have a couple of times. I once took a bus from Perth 
across, you know, right across the middle oh, to wow. Melbourne. Mm, yeah, that, I think it was. That was it. That was a, a long trip. Long trip, amazing experience, mm. and um, and yes, and it's it's just a, such a resonant country, isn't it? So I'd like to, and my son has been living in Australia. He's been posted to the Australian Navy, so he was on board HMAS Adelaide, which went to mm. Tonga, mm. and. Um, you know some of you will have seen about it in the newspapers so i was really keen to come and see him and spend some time there and of course my publishers are there but the last couple of years it's been nobody's been going anywhere no, hopefully <laughs> though so yeah hopefully things are a bit more easier to travel fingers crossed and so yes i would yeah. i mean i think it would be it would actually be a bit of a dream to um come and spend it maybe sort of a year somewhere mm. and really get to know it and then set a book there and mm. i'd i'd yeah i'd like that that would mm. be that would be fun yeah sounds like a nice idea <laughs> yeah yes just where there's quite yeah, a lot of Australia, lots of, lots of places to choose from <laughs> it's right it'd be another 30 years you'd, you'd it's just yeah mm. big country mm. Kelly wonders if you have a favourite author that um, as soon as they publish a new book, you make sure you go out and buy it. Oh, no. I mean, not, not that I don't, not that I, there aren't authors who I think are that great. Um, mm. It's just that there's so many books to read and I struggle to keep up with the ones I've got. Um, so, well, I, I, I always read the latest John Grisham. Mm. I'm not sure that's the answer you're yeah. after, but, um, you know, John Grisham, it's a bit, you know what you're getting with yeah. John Grisham. Mm. Um, and uh, so they tend to be, although they're not, they're not cheerful, they are sort of reassuring because you know where you're going. Mm. Um, so I guess the answer to that would be, would be, a, would be a John Grisham. But um, I, I've read all the Caroline Bonds. Caroline Bond is a British writer. I've tended to read all of hers. Um, and uh, I've just bought the second in a, um, a, a series by a British pathologist, Richard Shepherd. And as soon as I saw that, I, I loved the first one so much. As soon as I saw that, I got it. So, um, so I will, I will, there's lots of writers whose books I'll pick up if I see them, but there's nobody that I'm waiting like a cat by the mouse hole to yeah. grab their books. Yeah. And Belinda wonders if you had a favourite book from your childhood that you could share with us. Yeah, well, it's got to be Watership Down. Oh, okay, yeah, that was a good one. Mm. It was a good one. Mm. It was. Um, yeah, Belinda, I, I had Watership Down when I was, I think, about seven or eight. Um, I was quite I was qu quite a lonely child because we moved from Yorkshire to Birmingham and I didn't know anybody. And um, I used to get up in the morning. Well, I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning because I didn't want to go to school. I hated mm. school. And um, I used to bribe, I mean, who doesn't hate school? But anyway, I really hated school. And I used to bribe myself that if I could get out of bed, I could read a page. And then if I could put on a garment, I could read another page. And the oh. school uniform had a lot of garments. <laughs> and, uh, so I was always late for school. My mother was always shouting up the stairs. And um, they'd sort of, my parents would just sort of stand by the front door and give me toast as I ran out the door. Mm. But I did read a lot of books that way. And the favourite was Watership Down. I think I read it something like 10 times mm. by the time I was mm. 10. And, and it, it was Watership Down that really really hit me what that writers could or it struck me that writers could connect with you you know I remember reading there's this passage in Warship Down um, about a storm and the storm light and this crystalline quality the sound in the air the reverberation of the sounds before the first raindrops hit and the tension and, and I read that aged about eight and I remember thinking I know exactly what he means and I felt as so though the author Richard Adams was reaching out to me mm. and that was just such a um it was a wonderful feeling that i i knew what he meant mm. you know we were communicating and so i think that really started my obsession with reading and love of books and wanting to tell those stories myself and my brother paul queued up in the rain and got me a signed copy of watership down oh. which i've still got to this to this day oh, it's wow. very precious mm. No, that's a great story. Mm. 
Cheryl wonders what kind of work you did as a barrister and whether you miss any of it. Ah, um, yes, I do miss it. Mm. <laughs> um, Cheryl, I miss um, the excitement and and the, the, um, the sort of intellectual stimulation and the different stories every day and the camaraderie and the friendships. I had some really, really good friends and there's nothing quite like you know, um, the feeling you get um, after you've just made a jury speech or um, uh, or if all of you are sitting in the sort of front row in the court um, and you've, you know, you've all just succeeded in, in, in some piece of sort of justice. So yes, I miss it. I don't, on the other hand, miss, um, you know, some of the, the less good parts of it. It was really long hours. Um, it was a lot of stress and, you know, sometimes you just wish you didn't have this stress. I remember sort of wishing that I could just work in the canteen instead of having to go into court. And, mm. and um, every day is the most important day in the life of your client. Mm. It's, it, to them, this is, you are their lifeline and they cling to you. And this day will change their lives, yeah. maybe for mm. good, maybe for bad. Mm. And you are there for them in, in order to support them. And so, you know, there's a huge amount of pressure and stress because of, if, you, if, you're, if you think about that, if you think about what it means to them. I remember my pupil master early on saying, don't look down, never look down. You know, if you look down, you'll see how far you've got to fall mm. so but as for what kind of work it was it was a mixture of mostly most of the time in the early days i did everything but most of the time it was a mixture of crime and family work and the crime was both prosecuting and defending um and then there was a dovetail between the crime and the family work because um a lot of the family work i did was um family violence oh, okay. um or child mm. abuse mm -hmm. and sexual offenses Mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the crime I did was as well. Mm -hmm. So you would have, although the rules of evidence are different and you don't wear wigs in the family courts, um, a, a lot of the sort of cross-examination of pathologists or experts would be the same, so a lot of that. Um, and I did mediation as well, which was completely different. It was commercial mediation, and that was a wonderful contrast because with mediation, you can actually solve problems. You can actually mm. achieve things. Mm. And um, it's really positive. So that was that was great. I did that mm. towards the end. Mm. Mm. And a lot of the experience, I suppose, would help you with your writing? Absolutely, it did. Yeah, yeah still does. Mm. Yes, mm. yes. Partly just the stories that you pick up. I never use anybody's actual story, mm. but you, know, you mm. get the idea. Yeah. Um, the son-in-law, my... I don't know, third, fourth book. Uh, that's, uh, I remember being in court. The son in law is about a man who hits his wife, and as she's falling, she hits her head and is killed. And that was inspired by a case I was in where I was acting for the children. Oh, okay. um, and their father, who was in prison having killed their mother, wanted to see them. Mm -hmm. So it was a very different story, but you get those inspirations. Mm -hmm. But you also get a picture of how people behave and how they sound and even what their speech patterns are at times of crisis mm -hmm. and I, I guess just more of a connection with with people and when they really are in crisis mm -hmm. at uh, you know these terrible times of their of their lives and i did try to understand my clients and i suppose that's sort of helped to understand my characters yeah yeah and um I think it was Cheryl who asked what kind of work you did. She said that she's actually a lawyer in Illinois. Oh, are you? Oh, oh well, I'd be interested to know what kind of work um, Cheryl did there. Yeah, Cheryl, if you want to type hmm. what sort of work you do, <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, Melissa wonders if you find difficulty in coming up with your next storyline or are you someone who has lots and lots of ideas i do have ideas but i do have trouble with coming up with the next storyline mm. like you can have ideas you go oh that's a really interesting idea mm. for a book and then you write it down and try and do a synopsis and it's not it's completely pants and you just can't do it so i do i, I really and it's a this is probably the biggest stress i'd say in 
in this writing life mm. for me is am I going to be able to do it again mm. have I got another yeah. idea mm. well so, because or, your books have been so successful haven't they so have you um found it gets harder the more you write and the more successful your books are Oh, and in some respects, um, it does because there's, a, there's an expectation, yeah. mm. you know, <laughs> and you know, I always think, oh, I can't, I can't do that again. Mm. I, I'm not sure I could pull it off. It was only a fluke last time. Um, but at the last three, um, See You in September and then The Secrets of Strangers and this one now have all been increasingly well received. So you just have to hope that you can and cheryl said that she does similar to what you said you did oh but she doesn't do prosecuting right yes mm. oh interesting mm. that's yeah i found it helped to do i didn't do much but i found it helps to do a bit of both in that you get to see you know what, it, what it's oh, like for the too. other side yeah mm. Mm. well thanks so much for chatting with me again it's been great talking Thank to you. you um look forward to talking to you another time and um thanks everybody who joined in we had lots of great questions we did thank you jack it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you to everybody um for coming along yeah it's been and lovely hope everyone um people watching who haven't read your books go out and um check them out all of them, yes, and I, I think three of them are all, all for ten dollars each in Australia and New Yeah, Zealand. at Big W Which they is... had a good um, sale because I bought yeah. quite a few of yours at Big W when I think they were eight dollars right. actually. I think I paid eight dollars right. each for your books, so that's yeah, well, great. They've, they've all all been re-released for the three of them, the half the mm. back list of all, and in New Zealand as well. Mm. So I mean, that's certainly in New Zealand, a ten dollar book is quite unusual. Yeah. Yeah, mm, <laughs> no, they're a great yeah. price. Well, thanks everyone. Um, bye. Bye. Thank you.